I would like to start uh, with uh, the sign process, but in fact, I just want to say following to make the following very simple remark that if I have some configuration acts, so when I write configuration, I need just some subset of real life, the uh, collection collection X of particles. So X is a subset of the real line. And, and X does not have uh, does not have accumulation points. Does not have accumulation points. Accumulation. Does not have accumulation points. Okay. So uh, then. Uh, To this set, we can assign a function gx of t, which is the product. Uh, so x is my configuration, t is the variable. We can assign the function, which is the product 1 minus t over x. So this is the, uh, under some natural assumptions, this product converges. Uh, so we will consider this product in principle value, in principle value. So this product converges, and under some natural assumptions, it uh, defines entire function. Of course, it is quite useful to consider, for example, the example when we consider the set G Z minus zero of T when we get precisely sine by T over by T or by the Euler product form. By the Euler product. So the aim of this talk, the aim of this talk is to study this function, this random entire function for X, where X is the realization of sine process. X is the realization of sine process. So let me say first uh, a little bit informally, informally what it is sign process. What 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 is sign process? So uh, let me start with uh, eigenvalues of a unitary matrix. Eigenvalues of a unitary matrix. So uh, U in U of n. Distributed according to car matrix. Distributed according to car matrix. So I take unitary matrix and I consider it distributed according to car measure. And uh, uh, so uh, I consider it's unit. So uh, these eigenvalues, uh, these eigenvalues are distributed according to the following measure. So if I have par measure on the matrices, then the eigenvalues, so eigenvalues, I denote them by e to the i theta 1 and so on e to the i theta n. The measure of the eigenvalues is the following measure, product of e to the i theta k minus e to the i theta l squared product d theta k over two. So here the product is for k less than l and here the product is for k less than So this is the measure on a unit, measure on a unit. Measure on a unit. So the uh, uh, the point which is quite important is to keep in mind this presence of this one more factor. So the eigenvalues repel each other when eigenvalues are close. In fact, the probability is very small. This is very, it is very important to keep in mind. When eigenvalues 
are close to each other, then the probability becomes very, very small, disproportionately small. We will uh, make this remark more precise as the talk progresses. So the limit, the limit of these of this measure on eigenvalues, the limit as the size of the matrix goes to infinity n. And the distance between neighboring eigenvalues is taken to be on the order of one. So that is to say, that is to say, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the eigenvalues from the circle are taken to the real one. And uh, the distance is multiplied n, because obviously the distance between n and n is the circle is one over n, so I multiply it by n, so the distance becomes one. This series of process is precisely called the sign. This sign process, the best way of defining it, uh, the best way of defining it rigorously is to put expectation of multiplicative function. So I have a measure. So here, this was a measure on set of collections or on a set of finite collection. Now, when I go to the limit and goes to infinity distance, average distance, distance on average goes to one, goes to one. When I go to the limit, I have a measure on infinite particles. And measures on infinite particles, <coughs> it is convenient to consider measures on uh, infinite collection of particles. It is convenient to consider uh, expectations of quantities which I call multiplicative functions. So this is the key object. This is the key object of the talk. By the way, in old Russian literature, there is a much called Bogalubu function. You know Bogalubu. So this is just the Multiplicative function. So its product, uh, let us uh, for the moment assume that the product converges absolutely, but in fact, in practice, we will need many situations when the product only converges conditionally. So but let's just start with this simple situation. So it's a product of my function g over the particles. And the formal definition of the sign process is that the expectation of such multiplicative function is given to determinant. Of the following way, one plus g minus one s, where s is the sign term. S is the sign term. So the determinant is the infinite dimensional is threshold determinant. So for experts, uh, regular threshold determinant. But let's skip this detail right now. Also, just threshold determinant. And the and the uh, this determinant gives the expectation of the multiplicative function. This determinant gives the expectation of the multiplicative function. Okay, so this is the sign process, and in fact, I wrote this definition in terms of eigenvalues of random matrix. Because now you can see that this random entire function, this random entire function is nothing else but scaling limit of characteristic polynomials. Characteristic polynomials. Characteristic polynomials of this sign process. Characteristic polynomials of this sign process. So this is the scaling limit of characteristic polynomials of my excuse me, this object for sign process is the limit of characteristic polynomials for my okay. so my next aim is to explain how this characteristic polynomial behaves so I will explain uh, first of all in informal terms so and uh, then we will make some more formal statements. So the, uh, the aim of this formalism, let me start in fact with open question. 
So all the question is to prove that this characteristic polynomial considered as a random measure converges to Gaussian multiplicative case. Converges to Gaussian multiplicative case. This is all the question. The results that I will formulate all go in the following direction. So let me first formulate them informally and then I will be more precise. Uh, so that different values of this characteristic polynomial are normal random variables and they have a certain degree of independence. In particular, we will show, in particular, we will show in this course that gx of t over, so here we have all a product over all particles in the same process. So of this product, it does not belong in L2. It does not belong in L2. But in fact, we will show that even if we multiply, even if, excuse me, even if we divide by one multiple, by one multiple, it still does not belong in L2. So this is a little bit unusual situation because it shows a difference between finitely many particles and infinitely many particles. In fact, for finitely many particles, well, there are n eigenvalues. This is clear. So, and then the characteristic polynomial is obviously the characteristic polynomial is uniquely determined by its values at n points. But when we go to infinity, there is, so to speak, one particle more, one extra particle appears here. One extra particle appears here. Okay. So let me, uh, as this was informal statement, let me now pass to, <coughs> let me now pass to precise description of this polynomial. So and obviously, let me take the logarithm. Let me take the logarithm. Okay, I erase everything except this formula and I take the logarithm. So it is clear that logarithm of multiplicative function is additive function. So let me write this. I will write S F. S F of X is the sum of F of X over all of some quantity over all particles in my configuration. And so my next aim is to describe the behavior of this S F. And we shall see that these S F are essentially normal random variables in certain sense, but also with some differences, normal random variables, and we'll have, we'll have quite precise control of their uh, covariance. Okay. okay, so let me read a little bit more this. In fact, one can write One can write. By the way, let me say that uh, everything that I say uh, comes from the preprint, from my preprint, which is uh, which is called sign process as access one and is on the other. So one, this access one about which I spoke before and it is on the other. Okay, so so just all statements and all proofs are there. Okay. So uh, let me say that the expectation of multiplicative well, function, let me write it like this exponential of lambda etc., has the following beautiful form. Has the following beautiful form. So this is essentially a variant of Segel theorem, but with some Segel Segel theorem, but with some important modifications. So the form is this exponential of lambda times the integral of f. Well, this. Then there is very interesting object, very interesting object, lambda squared over two norm of f squared h one. I will I will define this. And then there is also very interesting correction term. <coughs> I will say about it a little bit 
a little bit more, but now let me just write this correction term, C of lambda, and I will say a few more words about it a little bit later. Let me just, in some sense, this term will be unimportant. Excuse me, I introduced notation and I confused myself. Let me write alpha. This formula is valid for all uh, complex alpha, for all complex alpha. Okay. So, first thing that one has to keep in mind is that this Sobolev semi norm, so let me, let me define it. In fact, Sobolev one half semi norm is one of the just these objects that appear everywhere. Why do they appear everywhere? Maybe because, because the Sobolev one half semi norm, so here f is just a function of the norm, and the Sobolev one half semi norm is the integral like this. Or which comes down to the same, the integral of absolute value of lambda at half lambda squared lambda. So this is the sum of one half semi norm. So and and maybe one of the reasons why it appears so much everywhere is that Sobolev one half semi norm is invariant, is preserved by dilations, by dilations. The action of the group of dilations preserve the Sobolev one half semi norm. So in fact, the L2 semi norm, if I act by dilations of the function, the L2 semi norm grows. The H1 semi norm, if I expand the function, so when I mean actual group of dilations, I mean, of course, f of t goes to f of t over r. So it's clear that under such operation, one can think of some little uh, function, little bump function. So it is clear that under such operation, L2 norm grows. H1 norm, the integral of the square of the derivative, decays. So H1 half norm is the one that stays invariant. I can see from quite clearly your eyes are deficient. So, and maybe this is the reason why it appears so often. So this is first remark. Second remark, which is very important to keep in mind, is that this quantity, this one half semi norm, it is not the variance. It is not the variance. It is not the variance. In fact, the variance of the additive function is given by the following formula. It is almost solid one half semi norm. It is, so I write, it is f of x minus f of y. But instead of this, I multiply by sine curve sxy squared dxt. So here you can see that I have not, not Excuse me, not <clears throat> excuse me, uh, not Sobolev semi norm, but Sobolev semi norm with correction around the diagonal. And this is to say I can rewrite this f x minus f of y, x minus y squared, so the expression of the Sobolev semi norm, and then there is sine squared. Well, I have pi. Okay. Sine squared pi x minus one. Okay. So this is more of so away from the diagonal. By diagonal, I mean where x equals one. Away from the diagonal, these two expressions are very similar. Around the diagonal, on the other hand, there is this correction term. So in fact, the difference between this expression and this expression is on the order of the H1 norm. Speaking very rough, on the order of H1 norm. And in fact, this correction term, this correction term will only depend on the H1 norm, will be controlled 
by the H1 norm. And there is a very important, very important difference between H1 half norm and H1 norm. So as I just said, the uh, excuse me, the H1 half norm is a very common dilation, whereas H1 norm decays on the dilation. So let me just write here, okay, I erase the let me just write here that for sign of alpha, it is Sasha, sorry. Uh, yes, okay. yes, please, please. Question. Uh -huh. Maybe it's a stupid one. Uh, just look at this exponential formula. It's the, 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 the exponential moment, right? Yes. Uh, so what do you assume about function f? Should it be non-negative? Function f should not be non-negative. Function f should belong to sovereign like one half class. That is yeah, but, but, but just, just if f is negative, so the right, the right hand side can be negative. How can exponential be negative? Because, because you multiply by f if it is negative, then, then it seems that. Again, because what? I mean, you multiply by the function f, right? Excuse me, I'm so, not sure I understand what you mean. X. Yeah, could, you, could you read what is written what is written in the right hand side of this, this uh, mathematical expectation? Uh, you mean expectation of? Expectation of exponential of alpha s f. Yes. Yeah, 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 yes. What is the first term in this formula? So it's some function c of alpha. Yeah, and then then it, you multiply it by exponential of alpha uh, alpha integral of f plus alpha square norm of f square. Okay, so so this cannot be non This cannot be negative, right? Exponential of f exponential cannot be negative. No. Okay. Okay. Because because. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe, no, but I don't understand the question. Maybe the, something is written in a clear way because it's uh, to me it's clearly exponential. Um, is everything clear? Okay, now? okay, okay. So maybe, maybe. So it's just it's exponential. Okay, yeah, it's exponential. So it's exponential. Okay, okay, okay. Expectation. So first term corresponds to expectation, and second term, well, except it's not bad. This is my. This is the whole point of what I was saying. This yeah, is, yeah, okay. There is this correction term. Okay, let's make this now. So the correction term, let me just finish the sentence and maybe let's see if this makes sense. The correction term is dominated by exponential of some constant, but we don't even care so much. Exponent uh, seminar of f h1, where h1 is the same seminar, but there is square. h1 times exponential f of value of alpha. And more F infinity. Maybe I should write this a little bit smaller. So we should write this again. C of alpha is less than exponential one over five. P mark one exponential uh, alpha. But here there is alpha two. Alpha exponential. Does it make sense? Does it make sense now? Yeah, okay. So just just I had an impression that, that you have written exponential of alpha multiplied by the integral. No, 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 no. Exponential of the whole thing. Exponential of the whole thing. Okay. Okay, perfect. By the way, please observe that already from this formula, it follows quite immediately. Already from this formula, it follows quite immediately. Corollary, and this is called central limit theorem of Sashiko. Central limit theorem of Sashiko. Is that the additive function of f of function divided by r of my root function f considered of integral zero? F considered of integral zero divided by square root of not square root, just divided by norm f h one half. Converges to the standard Gaussian. In fact, when I make this division by R, 
this C of alpha goes to one because of this F H one. And these quantities do not change. Well, F we, we assume F F integral of F zero, integral of F integral of F. So if integral of F is equal to zero, <coughs> then this quantity doesn't change, and this quantity indeed goes to one for any fixed time. So I should say that it is possible to give speed of convergence in this theory, and strangely enough, uh, the best result I can obtain in such a level of generality is very bad. It's just one over longer <coughs> So this is just the best I can do. Uh, okay, you can also see it in the preprint. So the best I can do in this in this uh, specific situation is one over log of r. So uh, one over log of r. Uh, it should probably be possible to do better, but I, in this generality I cannot. I can only do better under some special assumption. Okay. So let me just say that this key formula, this key formula, uh, so explains the meaning of this term. This is not so. Let uh, please please understand this. The surprising nature of the central limit theorem of social. I should say is that for unitary matrices. It has a direct predecessor in the work of Johans for CU for unitary. So uh, the central limit theorem of Soshnikov. So when F, please observe that it shows it gives convergence to normal distribution, convergence to normal distribution. Without any, how do I say, for random variables of fixed variance, there is no division, nothing grows. So R goes to infinity, but the variance doesn't grow, the variance is fixed. The variance is fixed, and in fact, this quantity is converts to normal. So cancellation, cancellation between the terms, so F, let me draw a little picture F. It's a bump function bump of integral zero, so something like uh, something like um, excuse me, difference of two bump functions. So when I delay it, these become uh, well, precisely delayed bump functions. So there is uh, there are very many particles which play a role, but their contributions cancel out so nicely that I obtain just. Gaussian random variable. And this is what follows from this form. Okay, after this preface, let me now look at let me now look at my favorite object, this characteristic polynomial. Okay, so I will I erase the sentence zero social book, but I and I erase everything. Uh, I just keep the formula for this for this norm. Uh, and well, I already erased, but let me say that you can see now the meaning, you can see now the meaning of the excuse me, you can see now the meaning of this term. So this is not, so it's very important to understand, this is not the variance of this term. So it's very important to understand this <clears throat> aspect uh, of this formula. This formula does imply subnormality of my random variable. So when I see of alpha, C of alpha, it's not only controlled, but in fact, it is uh, for alpha real, C of alpha is between zero and one. It's possible to prove that. That for alpha real, C of alpha is less, uh, is between zero and one. So, <clears throat> On the other hand, on the other hand, so it does give subnormality, but the subnormality is not with variance. So the coefficient of subnormality is not variance, it's what? It's so to speak asymptotic variance. Variance, if I delay f very much, 
in the sense of the central and the theorem of social. So this is my point. This is my point. So there is a correction term. So for small, I don't know, well, obviously, precisely as I mentioned, the difference between this expression, the solver one half norm, and the variance is controlled by solver one norm. And in fact, the solver one norm precisely enters into the game here. Okay. So now my next, my next heading, my next heading is to, my next heading is to, <clears throat> uh, is to apply this analysis to this function, is to apply this analysis to this function. So let me decompose this function in pieces so again, uh, please uh, allow me to say just this function. So this function, let to say, let me take the logarithms of this function. Some logarithm t minus x minus logarithm of x. Excuse me, you must have heard the ambulance, uh, they always pass when I, the moment I start to speak about mathematics, an ambulance passes. It's just, I have noticed it many times. So, uh, okay, uh, so just we have this sum over differences of logarithms. This sum converges in principal value because, in fact, at infinity, the sum converges as one. Okay, so this sum, as is clear, it has a certain self similarity. It has a certain self similarity, and it is this self similarity that I now want to exploit. So, first of all, let, me, let us recall that the Fourier transform of the numbers. is one over f in value of lambda. So please observe, and anyway, excuse me, excuse me, let me make one more remark before I pass to this Fourier analysis. Uh, very naive Fourier analysis. So then this function, this very function, this function, it is precisely, it has precisely the property that the variance, the variance is finite. The variance is finite, but the sober of one half norm is infinite. The variance is finite, but the sober of one half norm is infinite. And in fact, and in fact, if you think about it, this quantity, let, let me just this remark it will make things very clear. This quantity <coughs> considered as function of x for fixed t, for fixed t. So again, let me say here I am interested, I'm studying the behavior of this quantity for fixed, well, random, random x as function of t. So I'm interested in integrability of the square of this function in t for random x. But let me put it simply in a simple way. Just let me fix a fixed t, consider random x. It is already clear. If one thinks about it for a moment, that if I take this function to sufficiently high power, to sufficiently high power, then the expectation will be infinite. Why? Because particle x, which is close to zero, there is probability. Let us recall that my particles are limits of eigenvalues and eigenvalues are very close to zero. So when the eigenvalue becomes close to zero, the expectation, if I take sufficiently high power, power of the expectation will become infinite. Oh, the expectation will come into its goal. So, just this formula, it is not possible to write it for this function f because this function f is not in it is not in h one half. It is, however, uh, so it is not in h one half, and so this function, uh, the, the expectation, the exponential. This function does not admit 
exponential moments of all orders. It does not admit exponential moments of all orders. On the other hand, it doesn't get married. There is no contradiction because, in fact, again, the difference is in this function. The, the difference is precisely in the fact that the sum of one half semi-norm of this quantity is finite. But the the sum of one similar, the sum of one similar of this quantity is finite. On the other hand, the sum of one half similar of this quantity is infinite. This is everything that we're playing with here. This is my playground. Okay, so now I take the logarithm of x for a platform. It is one over maximum value of lambda. So we started, I think, 15 minutes late, but I will uh, finish before that. So uh, just <clears throat> so I have this one over absolute value of lambda. Uh, so and then I consider. So it is already clear, by the way, from the Fourier transform that again the h one will be finite, and the h well uh, at least if I consider if I uh, consider introduce some cut at infinity. Uh, just where so at zero consider at zero the h one norm is finite, but the h one half norm is it? Okay. So now I consider the function f0. It is convenient for me to introduce the cut in Fourier space. Very many. I just introduce one over. And excuse me, let me do one thing which I never should do, but I do it all the same. Let me change here t small by t large. So this t large is cousin of this is small, but in fact, I want to consider it large. Okay. So I consider one absolute value. And I consider some a cut characteristic function. Let us say between one and e. It doesn't matter very much, but let us say that. Okay. This is just what I need. Okay. Excuse me, and of course, uh, this is an addition. And I consider it even function. So this function already belongs to every space. So a, h, h, one half, h, one, h, whatever. <coughs> and one can see, one can see from these formulas that clearly logarithm of x, I write this formal expression. I read this formal expression. It's formal, it's form, it's purely formal, purely formal. It's equal to my definition f0 of t. So again, uh, I'm not interested in high frequencies. I don't care. But let me f0 of oh, excuse me, logarithm of excuse me, logarithm of t. F0 of t. Plus clearly F zero of E T plus which is more important for me F zero of T over E F zero of T over E square and so on. So the high frequencies are not important. So observe now that if I uh, Yes, if I consider now this t large logarithm of t large minus this. Well, it is convenient to consider uh, again in Fourier in Fourier space. So I can write, let me write just here, otherwise I run out of space. Logarithm of T minus T minus over T in for instance, it is equal to e to the i lambda t large t minus one over t minus one. So please observe that all the frequencies play a role except frequencies which are very small, which are smaller than one over t. They don't play a role anymore. They don't play a role anymore. So, in fact, 
when I consider this difference, when I consider this difference, It is not exactly equal. There is error term. So let me write small error term plus small error term. Error term plus. But in fact, now I can get the plus F naught. Plus F zero of T. Uh, F zero of T minus. F zero T minus F T plus F zero of T minus T over E minus F zero T minus T plus and so on F zero so plus and so on but the sum is fine so this is the key point this is the key point let me just say this e to the sum, some special number n0, where n0 is precisely the logarithm of t large. Minus, obviously, f is f0 from of t to the power n0. Okay, so this expression, this quantity that I want, has been represented as sum of shifts, sum of shifts, sum of shifts of of these sum of shifts of this how do I say sum of shifts of dilations of this random variable. There we go. Sum of shifts of dilations of this random variable. This random variable has been chosen just by definition in such a way that its dilations are our sum. Its dilations are our sum. Then, then comes the key observation. The key observation is that the shifts on the other hand, the shifts, the shifts, so what do we mean by the shift? The shift is just this, this question. This question. The shift of the variable. The shifts on the other hand become orthogonal. So, this is now the key, very simple observation, but it is the key observation for this whole discussion. So, let me write it. So, my. <coughs> so, let me write F. So, this was F0 of T. Let me write Fn of T. Fn of T is precisely well or clearly one over absolute value of plasma characteristic function of e to the minus n e to the one minus n of absolute value of plasma. So I can write, I, I rewrite this formula by, by saying that my function is lower t minus t minus lower t is small error term plus sum fn t minus t minus and from zero to n naught and naught is written here So Fn, which is important for me, since I rewrote this formula, I erased this one. It, I just copied it, I copied it there. It is important to keep in mind that Fn, Fn is just the dilation of F0. Fn, let me write here, Fn is equal to F0 divided by e to the power of n. So, and looking at this formula, we already start to understand many things. 
because Fn's they are independent. So looking at this formula, when I say independent, I mean they are going to be sort of independent. They're not actually independent because there are all sorts of pressures, but they are close to being independent. Fn's are close to being independent, and the key point, the key point, the key point, which I want to make, is that. <clears throat> The key point that I want to make is that uh, when I when I shift far enough, Fn shifted becomes essentially independent from Fn which we had before. So let me make this point clear. So in fact, when I shift when I shift, when I shift the argument far enough, so one can one can see this. So if you consider uh, just f, the sobre one half, sobre one half in a problem. So if I write just the definition. There is nothing. There is nothing else. So I have integral from e to minus n to e to one minus the definition. So I have one lambda. So one over lambda has to be lambda. Very nice. And I have this e to the i lambda <clears throat> e to the i lambda t divided. Because of the shift. And so making change of variable, I get e to the i mu mu, well, let's say epsilon, e to the epsilon, e to the epsilon, e to the epsilon, over t e to the minus n, t e to the minus n. And it is already very clear from what has been said so far that this decays as one over t. It decays as one over t. It's not one over t, e to the n over t. As is clear here. So as soon as t becomes bigger than e to the n, it starts to decay. It starts to decay, so they start to become Independent, more and more and more independent. More and more and more independent. This argument. So these are just. So this is the idea that I have these. So in fact, it shouldn't. Please let me make one thing very clear. It's, uh, it's uh, quite intuitively appealing from the point of view of the theory of dynamical systems. So imagine, uh, imagine. So this. Uh, process of division by uh, this process of division by e to the power n from the point it is very similar to taking ergodic integral. It's not ergodic, it's not exactly ergodic integral, it is sort of average ergodic integral, but it's very similar to taking this kind of uh, average ergodic integral. So, in fact, in fact, in fact, I take this average ergodic integral. And it is clear that it takes longer time for this average ergodic integral to become independent from itself. To become independent from itself. <clears throat> so, uh, if I have if I have uh, two ergodic, if I have an ergodic integral taken, so already I have integrated over time. So clearly, if I shift by a little bit of time. Then there will not be a independence. So to have independence, I need to shift by a long time, and that independence will be there, which is exactly what we see in this representation. So, and uh, before I conclude, uh, let me just make the following remark: that from these considerations, it is already intuitively clear, and this is what we shall see that these quantities are independent uh, or let's say they have a certain degree of independence but also their shifts have a certain degree of independence 
Also, their shifts have a certain degree of independence. Also, the shifts have a certain degree of independence. So now, uh, the key point is uh, the key point is that not only the shifts have a certain degree of independence, in a sense that I will make precise uh, on Frank. Not only, not only the shifts have a certain degree of independence, but in fact, <clears throat> probabilities of large deviations also have a certain degree of independence. Degree of independence, uh, which is which is called in like standard terminology, is called hierarchical independence. The image that one needs to keep in mind is the following: that I consider a binary three, a binary three, and I consider random variable, independent random variable, or one in say standard Gaussian doesn't matter, independent random variable in every branch of the tree, and then I consider sums of the paths in the tree. So sums of the sums along the paths in the tree, clearly they're not independent because two paths they have a common part. But when the paths diverge from the common part, they become independent. So there is not independence, but it is sort of independence. It's very, very similar here. So in fact, my vertices, my uh, my levels in the tree are the frequencies. The frequencies. My paths are the sums, which are of f n, f zero plus one plus f n. The choice of different paths corresponds to the shift. And precisely, precisely, two different paths, so two different shifts by different t, two different shifts by different t, become independent as soon as t becomes the difference between t's is larger than the corresponding frequency ranges. Then they become independent. Sasha, excuse me. Uh, what is the frequency? Frequency is this. Frequency oh, okay. makes sense. Frequency in the sense. Frequency, please observe, Andre, that we have frequency in very many sense. Please observe that we have this formula. So, by, by its very definition, something like one half norm can be written in very different way in frequency, in, in frequency space. So, in particular, if frequencies are disjoint, then the functions are sovereign or orthogonal, and so frequency in this, in this very specific sense, in the sense of the lambda. Does it make sense, okay? Yes, it makes sense. However, however, the story about the tree, if you could repeat it, it would yeah. be... If, if you repeat the, the story about, about the tree, it would be more clear. Okay. Can you repeat okay. once more? Okay. Okay. Oh, Let's yeah. tell the story about the tree. So, again, each shift, each shift of my function, I have some of these functions where in frequency space I go to lower and lower and lower frequencies. Now, when I shift the frequency, as a, the calculation that was just here that I erased for the solar, for the solar, so that is a little F and T minus T. Yeah, the solar product decays as one over. One yeah, over yeah. something, right? Yeah, it's the end over one over so precisely, the frequencies become the shifted frequency becomes independent as soon as the shift is bigger than the frequency range. As soon as the shift is bigger than the frequency range, but this is exactly what, what is symbolically represented by this tree. So going down are the frequencies, the lower frequencies, the, the closer to the root of the tree, the upper, the higher frequencies. The paths in the tree are my sums, my sums, my logarithms. So and the difference, so the shift of the logarithms, and the difference between the paths, depending on the shift, so this is my logarithm, this is the shift by t, the difference becomes independent. Starting from the frequency range here, which is high enough compared, to, which is yes, exactly. So all the frequencies except the ones which are low compared to t, frequencies which are lower than one over t, they are the frequencies which are higher, they become better. And the corollary for all these formulas, which we will discuss in great detail on Friday, the corollary is that the event that GXT is bigger than absolute value of t 
happens infinitely, it happens infinitely often. It happens infinitely many times. In fact, one can put bigger exponent, but this is the only thing I need for this. It happens infinitely many times. Alexander Grich, sorry, but I think uh, that uh, we... uh, so this happens infinitely many times. This event happens infinitely many times, which in turn implies precisely that this function with one multiple removed, with one multiple removed, is not square integral. Is not square integral. So again, from this independence, we obtain that this event happens infinitely many times. Which in turn implies that this function with one multiple removed is not very integral, which is precisely what we wanted to prove in the first place. We continue on Friday. Thank you so very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, maybe some uh, questions, comments. Uh, I have one, one more question about this central limit theorem. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So so before it was some some heavy combinatorics right so now, now, now this formula allows to to avoid this combinatorics right i mean when you when you prove central limit theorem for, for this for formula it. can be proved this formula can be proved in completely combinatorial way there are different proofs of this formula proof that i have in the preprint i follow proof of vidom which is analytic and which represents which represents toplitz operator as some commutator so it is just some analytic, analytic, uh, analytic proof. But there also exists. So in fact, this formula that I wrote, it is scaling limit of formula of uh, baradina konkov Geronimo case. I didn't say this, but it is. It's uh, so. And the proof of baradina konkov it's completely combinatorial. Just, just I want, I want to say that 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 before when we proved this this central limit theorem for regular observables f, uh, it was it was based on heavy combinatorics yeah, which was a kind of black box right so now now okay, it was based on can you say again it was based on it, it was it was based based on some heavy combinatorics which was a kind of black box but now now it's it's uh, it's a way to avoid this right uh, yes uh, the formula is obviously yes of course yes that's right uh -huh. the mm -hmm. formula of Radina Bonikov, it's sort of put combinatorics inside the formula but this is exactly the argument of Yes. Okay, I see. But it still holds only for the sign process, right? I think no, but we should prove this someday. I think <laughs> no. So this is exactly it's question you ask to me, but in fact it's question I ask to you. So so just you should I think in this question you know answer better than I. Okay, so okay I, think, I see. Oh, I prove this. Okay, I see. Uh, thank you.